Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, where it's our goal to help you become the best financial advisor possible and drive the positive evolution of financial advice. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor crew and I'm super pumped to be introducing this brand new series we're about to kick off all around the three P's of Plan Produce Profit. Now, the XY team has spent a lot of time thinking about what makes a great financial advice offering, a great financial advice business. And what we distilled it down to was that there are three key elements that you need to get right to have any level of success in your financial planning business. The first is about planning and how to plan an epic service proposition that's engaging for the people that you want to work with and compelling to drive real results within your business. The second is about producing and that's about being efficient in your business, streamlining things, maximizing the benefits of technology to uh, run a a scalable and uh, profitable advice service. And then the third is profit, which is all about getting your message out to a bigger market. How do you attract more people into this awesome offer that you're running efficiently and scalably? So I'm taking over over the next 15 episodes. We're going to have 15 advisors, going to be 100% advisors. I've had a bunch of fun with the recording that I've done so far, the interviews, and uh, and I've got a few more great ones to come. So I hope you enjoy this series. This episode is proudly sponsored by FE Analytics. Now, a number of XY advisors have already discovered this one-stop, easy-to-use tool that helps with investment research, analysis, portfolio construction, ongoing monitoring, and client reporting. Find out how FE Analytics can help you improve your business process, manage your existing client base, and win new business by contacting Bruce Jenner via bruce.jenner, J-E-N-N-E-R, at financialexpress.net or visit financialexpress.net for more information. Mate, so uh, Mr. Robertson, thank you very much for joining us today uh, for the last uh, the last podcast in the the uh, produce section of this series, which is all about plan produce profit. Uh, we've been talking about how do you plan a compelling service offering, how do you produce like a boss, which is what we're going to talk about today, and uh, and then coming up next, and I've, I've got a few epic guests uh, lined up to talk about profit, which is all about getting your message out to the to the masses not about like just rolling around in piles of dollar bills because if uh if that was the case mate i would have you straight in for uh for that for that uh session of the the series instead of this one mate welcome thank you for joining us thank you very much uh joining joining us from uh from god's country the the gold coast up there mate 30 30 and uh, not a cloud in the sky today or what (laughs) pretty much Pretty much 100 metres from the beach, looking at that, thinking, why am I spending my time in the office all day? But uh, the ultimate tease. You just told me you just got off the golf course, didn't you? (laughs) Yeah, I wish. (laughs) Well, mate, uh, thank you. appreciate, I know you're a busy man with all your commitments and the like, so I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, For anyone, anyone that doesn't know the man, the myth, the legend that is Hugh Robinson, um, he's won pretty much all of the awards going around. Uh, just check the, the top of the, of the front page of his website. He'll tell you all about him. Um, AFA Advisor of the Year 2018 uh, and, a, and a pretty good bloke as well, I suppose. But uh, just for anyone that doesn't know uh, about you or, or your business, hasn't seen you rocking the stages uh, on the tours around over the last year, tell us, uh, so your business, how many advisors? Yeah, so there's, <clears throat> on the lead advisor, we've got two what we call second chairs, so three ARs within the business. Uh, the goal there being that, number one, we can grow the advice the way that we see it should be, uh, which sometimes could be arguably unique. And secondly, just as, as a way that, of client comfort, knowing that they've got two advisors listening listening to, the, to their world and their scenario and two heads are better than one, so... There's a three of us. Intention is to grow more, uh, grow more second chairs who will then grow into first chairs uh, and that's probably going to be how we evolve as opposed to maybe getting <clears throat> existing advisors with lots of experience but maybe it's not the experience necessarily that we see our for, our industry going forward. Yep, massive. Yep, it's a, this is a huge pain point for me at the moment. I'm trying to bring in an advisor to, uh, an experienced advisor to take over a bunch of my clients and I'm finding that exact thing 
not only do they not uh, everyone everyone's business is unique, so it's like you want them to do your thing, but also it's hard to find good good people. I don't know where these these advisors that want great opportunities are hiding, but uh, you know, strategy. Uh, you you think there'd never be a better opportunity for them to put their hand up than right now with all the changes going on and everything? But uh, maybe, maybe some people are scared. Maybe they're a bit unsure. But the, the one thing that we sort of keep thinking about is client service is still going to which you just recently won an award in, mind you, uh, that's still going to be the thing that clients will still always want to have an advisor. Uh, one of my big beliefs is they want someone to be able to take care of their headaches. For sure, for sure. Someone to uh, someone to call, someone to blame, you know. Um, they need someone pulling, this, pulling the strings of the robot, I, I think, and uh, tech's obviously making it easy, but I don't think, you know, how, you just couldn't replace that personality of yours, Hugh. Impossible. Well, well, that is your challenge with growth is turn it from what maybe as a one as a one person man you it's built on your personality, build it into a business where it's not your personality, and that could be hard for advisors also. <laughs> no doubt. So, mate, so you got you got uh, yourself and a couple of second chair advisors there. What? Is, how? How big is the rest of the team? Uh, really, just another one and a half a client service officer. Uh, she's. And she controls the review process as well. And then a, uh, my wife who does all anything that's project-based because we've got three young children. We don't want to put pressure on her of things that are time, time-bound. So any big projects and basically also just someone that I can rant to about what's happening in, in my <laughs> world and get some perspective on things at times. So I think sometimes as advisors we can get a bit insular. So it's always good to get some perspective. Yeah, for sure. that happen in the world. Yeah, I call my wife the Swiss Army knife of the business because uh, you know no no defined role, but uh, but makes a lot of things easier. Yeah, most of the time, so oh, they do, they do because they're you know in my in my own experience, Joe's just smarter than me. So <laughs> it just works. Yes, it's uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I I haven't met your wife, but I'd say that you you probably that's almost definitely true. <laughs> <laughs> Correct, uh, mate. So how long how long's your business been growing? So, uh, two thousand and nine, it started. Two accountants merged their practices together and basically got me out of Whitaker McNaught uh, at at the time when CBA had bought Whitaker McNaught. So. We started there. There was a lot of inherent bad product, not not intentionally bad, but just some stuff that was unlisted and ultimately lost money. I, I made an assumption that accounts would be conservative in their investment strategies. So we spent probably the first two or three years tidying up, trying to get, get sort of back to baseline, back to, back to level pegging. And then once we got there, so around 2012, uh, 2013, I bought the business off. There were seven owners, so I bought the business outright off them. And from there, we've just sort of run it. And that's sort of gone up probably fourfold uh, since since we bought it. So that, that's always been the goal is just give good service and then clients will refer. Yeah. complicated at times. That's it. can be simple if you, if you let it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I probably should have asked you if I could ask you this one before, but uh, revenue sort of band, can I ask you that? Around the one, two, one, three mark. Uh, probably grows at about two, two fifty a year. Uh, so that's, that, and that's just that natural now. We, we sort of have no fee for no service clients. So we've, anyone that doesn't engage with us, we resign ourselves as advisor. So that, that was key. Even though you lose a little bit of revenue initially, you just get clarity. Uh, and it really, backs your purpose as to why you do what you do. You only want clients that are going to be advice takers and we don't really want the time wasters. Like time is our greatest asset, right? So we don't want to be wasting our, our time in a week chasing people that don't want to be advice takers. So, and then when you, when you get the guys who are the advice takers, they naturally become your referrals. So they become our advocates. Absolutely. And if I find that if we do a similar thing, but uh, if you, you, like you say, you've got these people that are half in, half out or disengaged and then you end up spending more time with them uh, that, than, you know, what you would with another client that you're charging, a, you know, a decent fee and doing good work for and, and making much more of an impact on as well. Well, I've always felt that, that saying, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. 
Yeah. And I've always thought, well, Centaur's not going to be that kind of business. If, if they're a squeaky wheel and we've done everything right, then we just need to disengage. We, we're not the advice firm for them. So, and that, that also gives the team a lot of conviction too when they know that if we're doing things right, we'll back them so that you know, clients that are maybe painful. They, don't, they need to be financial advice clients. So I don't disagree. They just don't need to be ours. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. And I think that that's, uh, well, I'm interested to, to get your efficiency tips here, but one of the things that I've got from, uh, from one of the, the other guests or a couple of them actually was around um, that, that that's a way to drive efficiency in your business because you're only, you know, working to your model and, and, uh, and doing the right work with, that you want to be doing with the, with the clients um, that want it as well. Hard, hardest thing to do, I'd, I'd, I'd say. Yeah, to, is to take that leap of faith and sack fee-paying clients in the environment when there's not a whole heap of them going around. Yeah, but it you've heard everyone say it. You just said like people say it and it works and and it does. It did in our case. Yeah, it's from conviction. Cool, man. So, what's your ideal client and what's it, what do you what do you deliver for them? So, the ideal client for us would be number one has complexity, some stuff that we see that is challenging to us uh, has that, that we can solve or put put to the people who could solve the issues uh, not, willing to take the advice number two willing to take the advice willing to pay for the advice delegator we don't we don't really want to be working side by side with people if we've got you know 10 items that we've got to action we don't sort of really want them to say oh we'll do five and they do five. So we always quote an all-in-one fee. We go break down the fee. Um, enjoyable to work with. One thing we always say to our clients, even at the start, is when I look at my calendar for the week and I see you in it, I want to make sure that I'm excited that you're coming in. I don't, I don't want to look in my calendar and, and see someone and think, oh, bugger. And, and that's <laughs> the benefit of owning your own business is you don't need to deal with, with them. If you're not financially driven, I'm sort of not motivated by money so when you've got enough it's easy to not be right correct (laughs) (laughs) Uh, well mate uh so so that's good good background i i I normally say to give us your story but i feel like you've you've probably covered covered a bit of that stuff um but today i'm keen to get your thoughts on you know how you how you build efficiency into your business clearly you've got a pretty small team um, some sol- solid, uh, you know, um, client numbers and 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 revenue there. So obviously you you you're doing you're doing uh, things fairly efficiently. Give us your take on on you know what what you think really drives efficiency in a financial advice business. Uh, typically, not the advisor. The for me, I my team is great. So I don't touch my calendar. I don't touch. Any part of the business, uh, I try and keep out of it as, as much as I can because otherwise I interfere and I'll go and research what's the best idea. So from our perspective, the way that we drive the business from initial call, uh, we initial client calls, we book a time for one of the associate advisors to call them. One of the associate advisors calls them and screens them. Part of the process we learned last year after we won that award was we got a lot of more prospects wanting to come in and see us and people that wouldn't necessarily meet our ideal client definition. So right. we had to start screening them and because we didn't want to start all these people coming in thinking that we were going to solve problems or have solutions for things that we didn't or yep. price points that they weren't willing to pay. So from there, initial screenings done, then we send out an online uh, client data form for them to complete. So that's efficiency number one, about 75% of the data that we want completed is completed uh, prior to the meeting. We know their situation. So when they come into the initial meeting now, that's the first time I've seen them or had anything to do with them. And at that stage, we really get to just sit down and talk about their goals, goals, hopes, aspirations, what they want to achieve, what, how we could help with that. From there, <clears throat> we complete the remaining 25% of the client data form risk profile we get the info consent form signed straight away. Every single meeting, we get driver's license every single initial meeting. And all of that stuff gets sent off even while the client's in the meeting. So already the clock's ticking for all those timelines that can lapse. 
from there, we've now got a complete client data form and risk profile, all the info consent forms sent off, and we do that for insurance, superannuation, estate planning, accounting. And from there now, we've got within, we try and aim within 48 hours, we've got a meeting minutes that get sent out to the clients. Within there can be, can be, it's not always, but can be, this is what we discussed, these are the goals, these are the objectives. And off, more often than not, we put in what the cost will be as well. So that way the client can be fully engaged and formed to make a decision. From there, usually it's, okay, we want to proceed. At that stage, we'll get, so within about four days after the initial meeting, We've now got it when they've said, okay, we want the statement of advice made or not. Uh, if they want the, if they don't want the statement of advice made, that's fine. Then it's the client gets archived. If they do, then we prepare that. That takes, we can knock it over pretty quick, usually in a couple of days. So if they come in Monday, 3 p.m., we can usually have them in mon the next Monday at 3 p.m. for the statement of advice presentation. And wow. We, that's on the initial engagement, again, the client, onboarded that's yeah. our way of doing it and that's then with the reviews it's a similar process even with them like considering the, the the proposal out to them and that sort of stuff yeah wow it's it's part of the magic of i always thought how intimidating it would be to walk into a lawyer's office or an accountant's office and i think walking into a financial planner's office or financial advisor's office for the first time when you're really not sure and the reputation that you hear, you've got to be quite game and quite brave to come into an office and sit across from us when even the recent ASIC report says they know we add value, they just don't trust us. Like, yeah. And I think, okay, well, <laughs> let me prove. Let me prove it to you with quick prompt service. It's going to be based on your goals. There's not, we don't talk about product at all. I don't think many advisors do anymore. We don't talk about investment returns. We, we talk about their goals and objectives and how we can help. So that that to the client, and it's also you think about how you know yourself as a child, your whole world changes. How busy we are, and you were busy before a child. Imagine these people with you know adult kids or teenage kids driving them everywhere. They're just distracted by life. So we've got to keep them interested in the financial planning process. And if we can do it within a week or two weeks, they're still remembering what we talked about. If it takes more than that, then we need to get them in for a basically an in-between meeting just to remind them of what they want to achieve, why it's important. So the quicker, the better. That's always been one of, I think that was one of our major reasons for the quick growth. Yeah, absolutely, man. I think we do a, uh, we have, we have three, we do three meetings as part of our process. We'll actually fall with the, with the intro, but I find that when, if you have a too big a gap in between any of the meetings, then it's like people are forgetting what you spoke about. Like you say, you have to refresh everything and it's a, you just end up burning a bunch of time and we, uh, you know, everyone's busy. Uh, so, uh, you know, appreciate that sometimes it can be hard for people to make stuff work, but I find that if you don't keep, you don't keep that momentum, as you say, that, uh, you end up wasting time, uh, trying to say things that you've already said. Well, it's like yourself. You're obviously a gym junkie from the time we've spent together. And you can tell that if you don't keep going to the gym, you might, you may start not getting out of that habit. And I think that creates positive momentum. And that's even now, even with some of the more complex clients, that will be done over a number of meetings. Uh, but traditionally, if it's a, someone, we've got a lot of people who are retiring and they're, they're really just looking for someone to, to manage the stress for them. And those can be done over in discovery meeting and plan presentation. Yeah. Sometimes we do the strategy one in between. That's probably going to get more and more common. I think yeah. we get more and more complex clients. And how do you, you must have a pretty tight sort of behind the scenes process for, to turn all of that stuff around to, you know, within the time frame that's there. How have you gone about, like, if you think about, you know, where things are at today, how did you go about sort of, planning for that level of efficiency or, or creating that in your, in your service? The, the people, are, the people are our process really. And they're, they know what their job description is. They know what's expected. We've got <clears throat> every morning, there's a you know quick 15 minute meeting every morning. We've got an agile board up there. So we've got, um, there's about 20 sections of it. And we've got just movable tiles on the magnetic board. 
that we yep. move across. So the client's got to move across. So you know, and we know in, on that board whose area of responsibility is. So if I'm dragging the chain a bit, it's and there's no there's no boss in Centaur. There's not. I'm not the boss. The girls are actually the boss because they're one managing the workflow. And so with that, often I'm I'm the bottleneck in our business. So as Centaur continues to grow, the one thing we're trying to solve more, me being the bottleneck. So right. that, that's getting taking your ego out of it and knowing that efficiency is not my strength. Mine is, you know, I don't know. Um, <laughs> not, not efficiency. It's a great question, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and but they, you know, and their efficiency makes me look good to clients. So I make sure I always tell the clients, if you send me an email, it might take two, three days to get back to you. If you send it to the girls, they'll get back to you that day. Yeah. And the other thing then is we've always been careful not to give them too much work. So yeah. I don't, we don't smash them with work. And so how have you, how have you planned your team? Like how long are the guys that have been with you for now? How long have they been in the business? And was it a, like a, a bit of luck or was it, you know, were you structured in terms of how you, you've built that out? I think oh, we, we can plan. What was Mike Tyson's saying? Everyone's got a strategy till they get punched in the face. Yeah. Now, ours, ours was similar to that. I got, I got lucky with Jenna. Uh, Jenna's just a workhorse. She is very efficient. Uh, she's not great at technology, doesn't want to, and she will admit she doesn't want to learn what, the technological solutions are she's happy to just go right tell me what to do i'll get in and start digging and she will get through that yeah and when it was just her and i that was unreal we just worked great as a team and there was a real synergy there between what we did then we added Alyssa to this so jen has been with me probably seven years now i might be getting close to eight oh. the Alyssa's been here close to four uh, and she's again very efficient, very process driven. So she worked with Ford. So that was I was actually always looking for people that had worked at McDonald's because yeah. I figured the process, how they all run processes there. I thought that would actually make a great employee. Um, <laughs> but so Alyssa's again process driven. So what we then articulated early on in Central was what are the processes, systems, and processes that we need to follow for a successful client outcome. So our checklist might have 60 odd things on there that we know we need to check off to keep sort of the client moving along, along the path. And if we do that, we know that we're going to have a satisfied client within a reasonable time frame and a compliant file. And big, big key for me was I always want to be able to do that, get the client. Once the client joins Centaur, I then want to be able to put that file away and not have to worry about it again until a task pops up or until a review or whatnot. I never want to think, oh, actually, maybe we didn't have a driver's license on file or maybe we didn't have this. Yeah. Uh, that's that's where the girls are great. We just implemented the process. At first, we thought maybe clients won't give us uh, the driver's license at the initial. They all did. We thought maybe they won't complete the client data form prior. They all do. So you've just got to do it and sometimes explain it. But so that was effectively how we built it. Jenna wanted to go into also more of, so she was a power planner, wanting to be more of an associate advisor. Um, so building her into that, and then last, or the beginning of this year, hired Sarah as a. So she has about eight years of industry experience. So her as then an associate advisor as well. So we split the clients down the middle, and then they've now got their own panel of clients with me as the principal advisor, and and the goal being for them that they both grow into the role where they become their own principal advisor. Yeah. So, so that's what we've always said. Centaur is a choose your own adventure. While we're at the size we are, you can you can control your career destiny. But if it if in a few years time, you know they're not principal advisors, then we're going to have to go and hire principal advisors. Yeah, so it's that's the benefit of small. You can be nimble. You can move quick. But as yeah. it get larger, we will be slower to move and more rigid, I suppose, in the who you need for what seats. Yeah, and that's that's the challenge of, of growth. That's the challenge of building a sustainable business model. Yeah. Which is a fun challenge. It's a good challenge. Yeah, definitely. Oh man, for me, I think the team and the structures around that is the, one of the, the most difficult parts, like the right people. And then how do you, how do you obviously set them up for success? But like you say, like you shape them into the role that's meeting the needs of, for them, for the business, for the clients. It's uh, 
it's a, you know I think after a while you figure out how to do a uh, investment strategy or a super strategy or whatever, but it's like a whole whole another skill set to say what is the you know how to lead the team, manage the team, create the structures for that. So yeah, create that culture. You know you can look at any great team and there's always a great culture. <laughs> and I think how do you you could have a superstar admin person who just kills your team, squashes it, and then you could lose great team players. So I'm always, you know, you, you hear the, the great sports coaches out there and they always talk about hire for attitude because you can teach the rest. I can, if you don't have the skills, I can teach them. If you don't have the resources, I can provide them. But if you've got the bad attitude, it's, it's not going to work. Yeah, I would say, though, that it's possible to have a good attitude and not be the right uh, fit for the business. There's a, um, as, uh, as the marketer of the year, Michael Back, would say, there, there's the success triangle, um, which is, you know, motivation, capability and desire. And I think that if any one of those is, is lacking, it ends up dragging down the rest. Um, we had that person. <laughs> we had that person, the best attitude you've ever had in your life. Just horrible at a job. Yeah. But but it's true. You and you've got it as a you can never spend enough time thinking about this stuff. Um, and that was Phil Jauncey was the guy I was thinking about. He once said, you know, you gotta know what to do, how to do it, ability to do it. You can teach all of those, but the choice, the attitude to do it. If they don't have the attitude, it's trouble. Yeah. Mm. Totally. Uh, so, mate. T- so, tell me if you think about your business now and how you how you go about things. What do you think? What's the biggest change when you wind back to uh, to you know where things started around efficiency? I mean, around efficiency is probably the confidence to run our model and not. I think especially earlier on, as we were trying to grow, we were really almost order takers someone came in with a self-managed student fund and a couple of direct shares and said, that's what they wanted. People came in and said this and that, and we were kind of trying to be all things to all people. And it really was tough because I'm, i naturally want to be a people pleaser. That's a flaw in my personality. Or something. <laughs> I think it was really hard because you wouldn't say no to these people and you'd seen their experience before and it hadn't been a great experience. You're thinking, all right, well, I'm sure, you know, once you become a client, once I build trust, you will take my advice. But I think we got to that point where we just start saying, this is what we do. We know it works. Do you want to be a client? And coming come to that realisation from a process point of view, that we get in, building our corporate confidence that we were actually, we were good. We tried hard. We were delivering good outcomes. And that actually started coming from, we started, surveying clients and we, we were surprised that oh they actually think we you know they actually do really like us they do believe that we help so narrowing down our list of services and our service offering to say well look we just we just want to work with like-minded people and the client that that was the secret is just working with like-minded people basically delegators and saying no to clients so saying no to fee-paying clients that was really that's uh yeah one of the uh mark nagel actually who i I had for this series uh earlier on i think he might have been the first one for this section of the of the series that he was talking all about that same thing that one of the most inefficient ways to do business is you you're you're all things to all people and it means that it's almost impossible to have a you know, you've got your your admin person or your second chair that they don't want the technology, but they just need to understand stuff. And the more things you've got going on, the more things you can, you know, lose track of or get wrong. And um, when you create that consistency, it allows you to drive things from a tech perspective, but to mm. deliver a consistent experience. And importantly, I think for, for an hour and to imp- like to refine and improve your client experience as well. Because if you're delivering 15 different things, it's hard to go, well, there's this bottleneck here or there's this thing that we can improve there. Whereas if you're just on the uh, the McDonald's process, not to say that it's cookie cutter, but the, the, the process is consistent, but the outcomes are uh, uh, custom, obviously, to the person. That's where uh, you, you, can, you can make those improvements, test and measure. And I think that's one of the best things about financial advice is that you do, you change something slightly different in a meeting or uh uh, or how you approach things or how you explain something. And then <clears throat> the people, don't, they don't know that it's the first time you've ever done it, but you yep. do. 
So it's like the test, it's like the mad scientist, right? Well, that's, we're doing that with just goals-based question at the minute. We're reshaping some of the questions we ask, the way we position it, do the framework, because we find it can be uncomfortable at first talking about all that stuff. I think also, here's my, here's my great, you know, 2 a.m. keeping me up thought process at the minute. Thinking of if you actually created your customer feedback off your initial and even off your ongoing clients, do surveys after after the meetings, mapping it to the client experience that you want them to have. Just keep testing. Okay, so simple things at the first. Were you greeted at reception? You know, with a warm, friendly smile. Were you offered a drink? Um, do you think that in the first meeting, you know, they tried to uncover the advisor tried to uncover your goals and objectives? Do you did were fees explained? So then if you're mapping out that whole journey and clients are giving you that consistent feedback, I think you could just, re- I keep thinking about, it. we could just really make that a perfect client experience. And then, then we know how to then go to market on how to, well, that part of your profit series is, how do we then go to market with that and say, hey, we now have our ideal clients. We now have our proof points as how we deliver the outcomes. We now, you know, so yeah, yeah, the data is king. It's interesting. We just launched this major reporting project, but similarly, I think one of the things that I've thought of, especially as I'm thinking about growing, well, we are growing our team, but thinking about growing it further. And I think one, yeah, you can deliver an amazing experience, but also it allows you to get really good metrics on, you know, who's performing, who's outperforming and is anyone mm-hmm. underperforming? And if they are where, uh, you know, it's one of the things that we do for our clients, but we, there's no, not always an internal um, you know, me- measurement for that. So I think, great idea, man. I like it. Okay. Um, cool. So look, thinking, um, well, I've, I've had a few comments from it, from some of the guys on, on this series about, you know, they, they've done some stuff and, and it didn't, uh, you know, you launch out with this initiative and it doesn't work out the way that you planned. Have you had any, had any, uh, you know, uh, any of those ones? I can see a, a, a head yeah. nodding there. Yeah, as I'm crying, thinking about all the time and money I've spent on it. Uh, yeah, so we tried to roll out HubSpot last year. Um, I can see that technology. I can see what it can do, and it can be fantastic. I believe in one-to-many communication. Uh, I would love to be able to provide an amazing educational experience for not not clients, not even prospects, just but just for the consumer because I think currently we're suffering this reputation that everyone thinks we're greedy. So I would love just to create this educational program for free and put it out there and HubSpot was a, was a way to do it. Um, and then, then the metrics of that and, and then we could have the, that, you know, that's the, you know, that's the give back to the industry and then the, the 1% or would have been more bespoke, more tailor-made, and and that permission sort of permission based marketing that was stuff that I really and that's all based on content and that was something that I really I really enjoyed the the thought of and unfortunately in my world at the point in time there's just not enough time to do that and that so that we spent a, a good amount of money on and a good amount of time on and we never really got got the traction on that so which then meant, you know, we had changed website, then had to go back to our original website. We were using HubSpot instead of MailChimp. We did all, all this stuff that we had to then go and reshape. Uh, other things was we, we bought a book of doctors. We got about 50 doctors as, as clients. And I thought that we could really, the insurances that had been, the way the insurances had been written were inefficient. So I thought, great, we'll really be able to help these guys and that would be a really good bang to tap. Um, And it really didn't work out that way. They, a lot of them ended up being very transactional by nature and didn't want the holistic advice offering when we're more wanting, you know, oh, I want this, I want, you know, I want, it was like we were McDonald's, they just wanted a Big Mac and we're about the whole experience here. about the Happy Meals. Yeah, they were. (laughs) And... So from from our experience, that really didn't. We probably didn't work hard enough on it, uh, but it was just transactional by nature, and that's something that just doesn't really sit. I, I believe there's a, a spot for transactional advice for people that want to do that, but that's not the space that I want to play. Yeah, and that that was really frustrating because there was just one of those things where you just see potential. You're there, yeah, it's really amazing, and getting into 
you know, 50 doctors and their potential referral network. Yeah. That could have been great. But then there's other guys that are specialists in that field and they're, you know, almost micro niche but super deep and they love that space. But they're doing the yeah. property advocacy. They're doing a lot of other things, maybe cool. tax accounting, which we don't. We yeah. don't do either of those things. Yeah, That's yeah. Cool. It's interesting you say about the content marketing because uh, I am not having time because I actually looked on your website and saw that you managed to put out like 15 blogs last month. Is that uh, is that all your handiwork or what, mate? Yep, 100% online. No, no, no. Um, outsourced company does the majority of that. Um, Advent, if you guys have heard of them. Um, yeah. So that's they do that for us. Um, and they, they do that for a number of advisors. They, they will basically white label all of that. Yeah. So you, you do have the issue of it's not, it's unique. not all, uh, you know, unique, but for, for us, I think all that content side of things has got to be on the point of if you're, you, you just have to do a newsletter. You just have to like, that's, yeah. Everyone has to send out news that that's just a ticket to the game. That's you're not, if you're not doing it and your client's at a barbecue and he says, his mate says that he got a newsletter from his advisor and, you or your client doesn't get the newsletter, I think that can become problematic. Do you reckon anyone says that at a barbecue, that they got a newsletter from them? I really hope not. And <laughs> if that's the barbecue they go to, I don't want an invite. Sounds like a pretty shit barbecue to me. Yeah, I've had better. <laughs> uh, uh, so what about on the other side, though, of that, of that equation, where is there anything that you found that has worked really well that you, that you weren't expecting? Yep. Referrals from existing clients. I think that was the one that really surprised me that you get, if you could identify who are the influencers within your client base, they're massive. Like if we looked at, if you looked at where CentOS had really good growth, there's probably about 10 clients who have referred five people each or, or more. And the good thing about that is they're referring like-minded people. What we did learn from it, though, was that we can't incentivize that. It's got to be raw. It's got to be authentic. It's got to be organic. Yeah. By, I can't think of any cool, you know, other names. But um, it, that's our clients didn't want us to incentivize. When we said, hey, hey you know, we're going to give you a $50 gift card, they said, no, we, yeah. we want to do it because we believe in you. And the part of that has been uh, introducing them to the team, them knowing that we are looking for clients, and every now and then just put into the conversation, you know, something to the extent of we like working with like-minded people. Um, you know, I'm sort of a bit cheeky. I'm like, well, the more you send people who are like you, um, again, we'll design central around our client base. So if you're sending more people like you, it's going to be a better experience for you. Yeah. If uh, we get more people like someone else, business will be different. But <laughs> that, that's worked well for us uh, and servicing. So we see our clients often. We always say call, like it's way easier for them to give us a five minute call to talk about something than it is to come to us after the fact and say, hey, we bought this investment property off the plan, paid a 20% cash deposit, it's going to be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> That's, you know, we've had those phone calls and we say, why didn't you just call us? Could have taken yeah. five minutes and saved you a world of hurt. So we, we're very encouraging of that. And I think that's, you're always going to get, we always get when they call, they always get Alyssa answering the phone or Sarah or Jenna. So they're always getting that human contact. So they don't feel like a number. Yeah. That's key to it. Mm. Cool. And what do you, where do you reckon most people go wrong when it comes to efficiency? It's obviously, it's a bit of a, you know, a buzz thing and, and people, uh, you know, everyone's trying to, trying to do things. Technology is, is, a, is a big one, but, uh, obviously there's a, there's a lot of pain out there. If, if you don't, where, what do you think that, the main thing that, that people get wrong? Data collection. The If I'm looking at the guys that I see and talk to, they have that first initial meeting and don't collect data because they're trying to not necessarily win the client, but it, it is. They're sort of there trying to communicate value and how they can help. And it feels very impersonal. And now say, all right, well, now what's your address? How much? So unless, unless they're weaving that, the experts weave it into the conversation. Mm. But for you know the the younger person who's worried about compliance and trying to get to that client data, they might then go, all right, well, we had a good meeting, and I think also clients want leadership, 
So I think sometimes advisors are reactive and waiting for the client to get back to them on things. So even on following up after they see a client, it can just be an email uh, that we say, hey, was there any other questions or you just want to get started with the statement of advice? That's such a simple thing, but it's a stump by nature that they're going to become clients. We've shown value, we show that they can help. And then funnily enough, they go, oh, sorry, we thought we'd already emailed you. Yep, let's go ahead. Yeah. So they clients want leadership right now more than ever because they're, time, they're more time poor than ever. And yeah. They want to, you know, there's, they want to make sure they're taking care of their family and that's your insurance and your estate planning. They want to pay debt off as quick as they can. They want to have a nice, happy retirement. They want all those things that financial advisors provide. Sometimes they just haven't seen the value of it yet. So if you can illustrate that value and don't be scared to tell a client they're wrong. But if I go to the doctor and say, I'm in great health and he says, oh, hang on. <laughs> After this data I've collected, I think otherwise, I probably should listen to him. And that, that's the crisis of confidence that advisors are having at the minute, I think, in that we're all a bit, we're all a bit gun shy because we feel like we've been punched in the belly about a thousand times over the past 10 years. But we do add value, people see it, and we've just got to start believing in it and have communities where we all get together and say, hang on, let's prop each other up a bit and go, no, no, as long as you guys try and do the right thing, we're good. But, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's it. I think that they, you know, there's all those stats out there that, that uh, say that, that, you know, like you say, we're, there's the trust is not there when people don't know us, but everyone that has an advisor is typically very happy with, with their advisor. I face the same challenge in our business that before someone dives in, they don't know the value that they're going to get. And it's, it's, it's sometimes it's hard to say, to tell them exactly what that's going to be because if you don't know what the strategy is going to be because you don't know what's important to them yet. Uh, so that's the thing we go through now we you do this really great goals meeting with a client. Okay, so that's great. You've come in, you've talked to, I've gone to the doctors. He's talked to me all about my health goals. I go, great, that's amazing. But he hasn't shown me that he's the guy that can solve them yet. So we're constantly in between this conversation within ourselves at the minute of what tools do we need to show value in that initial meeting versus conversation? So how much listening do we do versus showing our expertise? Mm. Yeah, don't have an answer for it yet. I'll report back when I do. Well, clearly you're uh, finding some sort of decent balance there, mate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe. Uh, let me ask you, if you could go right back to the start clean slate, what's the one thing that you would do differently? Good question. I would use index funds and not try and be a portfolio expert. I would get onto the goals quicker and have more financial planning based conversations. I think early on when I started, I was more certainly the quote unquote investment specialist and enjoyed yeah. talking about how great investing was. And over time, I sort of, I think you evolve and you go, hang on a sec. I really like giving people peace of mind and investing doesn't necessarily do that. So if I could go back and start again, and I wouldn't be the technical guy I was. I was the guy that's doing Centrelink calculations in front of a client at the initial meeting to show yeah. them that they could get an extra, you know, 52 bucks a week age pension. <laughs> Four, four <times. laughs> and that was probably wasn't a value add. So, and, and being clear on what we are as a profession, we're, you know, obviously we're, we're people that are trying to help people reach their goals. That's, that's where we add value. That's what we do. And if we could focus on that more and have, have the confidence that, okay, if I can show you that value, you know, will you pay the fee? And then, and then put my fee up every year, find, find my price. Clients will tell you what your price is. Yeah. So soon enough. <laughs> exactly. Nice mate. Well, uh, Hugh, look, I could, uh, I could, you know, ask you questions all day, I'm sure. But uh, I just got a few quick ones for you be- before we wrap. Um, what's your biggest oops moment or stuff up? All the time. Put in mouth for me. Um, <laughs> talk, talking too much in meetings is always a problem I've got. The big stuff up. Oh, too many to tell. Um, <laughs> too many. Calling people wrong names in meetings after I had my first child. Forgetting. Oh, that's sleep deprived. 
could talk yeah. to Sally, but her name was really Anne, and they were too polite <laughs> to pick me up. Um, just big oops moments. Yeah. Heaps. Every week there's one. <laughs> Every week. I, I make mistakes all the time. <laughs> just, just not bad ones. I, and anything that's really important, I make sure I double check. But call, calling people, actually returning calls to people when it's actually their birthday and not oh, realising. Yeah. I think that's all. Yeah. Hey, and, uh, great, it's just my birthday. I think, oh God, I should have known that. <laughs> that would have been nice value added. Yeah. Uh, what's, the, what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? In a bad market and clients are really upset, um, don't take a personal, remember that they're scared. So I took over a big book of clients during the GFC. And so all of a sudden these clients that I'd never advised were looking at big losses and screaming at me on the phone, crying at me on the phone. The screaming I could handle, it was the crying that was really difficult. And I remember someone just said, you know, remember they're, they're just, they're scared. They think they're, they're losing their life savings. They're not. And that, that just reframed everything for me to go, okay, I've got to help. That's not, don't take it personal. Yeah, that's a good one. What's your, what's your top tip for teams? Team, be a team player. Don't be a douche. It's not about you. Lose the ego. Um, you're the leader. It's sort of almost, I invert it. Um, your team should be better than you. They, and you've got to enable them to be as good as they can get, even if they, it means that they're going to leave you. Um, you do the right thing by them, though, and be flexible. I think nowadays you have to be a flexible employer. But, and don't be a douche. Don't, any success that you get is as a result of your team. Don't let it go to your head. Ever. Or they'll remind you. If you've got a good team, they'll remind you when it goes to your head. Nice, mate. Um, and my last one for you is, what is your spirit animal? Oh, we talk about this a lot. Uh, I don't know. I would I would have to go with the staffy because the staffy is a real nice, friendly. You know, I should say centaur because that's our business. They're probably a staffy, just happy, happy around, generally. But what's my alone time? And you know, I never <laughs> just, don't get, just don't get me angry. I don't like it when I get angry. <laughs> That's it. What's your spirit animal? Uh, it's funny. The, uh, Flamingo. <laughs> no, I said, uh, we were talking about this the other day in the office, and I said a badger. <laughs> You're the first person that's asked me that, though. Because uh, up, up until a week ago, I don't think I really had a good answer. And I, I, I have been thinking it because I've been asking other people where I was thinking, you know, badger, um, you know, good work ethic, uh, very a lot of perseverance, um, determined. Yeah, I don't know aerodynamic. <laughs> I uh, yeah, I was going to go with unicorn, but that's just weird. <laughs> no, I'll I'll go with centaur. Wisdom of man, strength of a horse. How's that, mate? Very good, very good. Well, Mr. Robertson, uh, very much appreciate the time, mate. Thank that's you. Good.